So we have, uh, I think, one faculty member from Kokomo, one from the Northwest region, one from North Central, and one from here in the Northeast region. And then uh, one of the nice things that this gave us the opportunity to do was to spotlight our sample award winner for this year. Uh, some of you are aware, hopefully most of you are aware, that every year, every region of Ivy Tech nominates one uh, sample award uh, nominee. They're called the President's Award winner at the regional campus. And then in June, one of those 14 faculty members from Ivy Tech gets named to be the sample winner for the entire state. It's kind of our faculty member of the year. And uh, once upon a time, quite a few years ago, Candy Schladenhofen was the faculty member of the year uh, out of the Northeast region and the sample award winner. Well, last year's winner was Angel Beats, and Angel is an associate professor of communication in our Madison region. And so this gave us a nice opportunity to spotlight for the entire state our, our sample winner. And so Angel is going to moderate this session. And uh, she's a professor of communications, as I mentioned, so that's perfect. So I appreciate Angel driving up today from Madison, which is down a little further to the south, to moderate this session. And uh, once she has uh, introduced each of our panelists and they've given a, about a five minute overview of something they're doing in their classroom that's working, we'll give you an opportunity if you have some questions or maybe you would like to share something you're doing in your own classroom. And then we'll wrap this up. Angel will close it. You're not going to hear from me again. And you're welcome to be, yeah, thank you. I'm glad to that, right? And you will then uh, be officially, I think, on spring break. As soon as you get home. So again, uh, I hope this has been helpful. I'm sure there are elements of this that you think, well, I really didn't need that or I knew that, but I hope that you could look back on this day. One thing that you learned that you could do at least, it might help you in your advising or in your teaching. Uh, that's what we, we were really hoping for by having these. So Angel, let me turn it over to you. And thanks again, everyone, for being part of this day. Thank you. Good afternoon. You know, the other two sessions we did down in Sellersburg and Indianapolis the past few weeks, we've been the only session between everyone else and the weekend. And so now being the only session between you and spring break puts a lot of pressure on us, I have to say. Um, but I do think you'll get some benefit from our session in the next 60 minutes or so. So as a faculty member, I've been with Ivy Tech about eight and a half years. And one of the things that I've always craved is just ideas, tested ideas that my colleagues have used to work in their classroom. So the idea behind this session is to give you some of those ideas and tell you what's working in our classrooms right now. So I'm going to introduce each of my colleagues up here, the five of us are each one to share for approximately five minutes a teaching idea that has worked in our classrooms. And then like Dr. Baker said, we'll open the floor up to maybe your own ideas and also some questions you might have. So I'm going to start first today with Dr. Scott Simmerlein, Assistant Professor of Life Sciences in the Northwest Region. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? I'm Dr. Scott Sigerlein. I am an assistant professor of life sciences at the Valparaiso campus. I teach anatomy and physiology there, exuberantly, as some of my students will say. Uh, and it's really a great pleasure and honor to be here today to, to share with you a couple of practices that work well for me. Okay, so, oh, hang on a minute. That was fun. There we go. All right, so, you know, in order to engage, to engage students, you have to get their attention in some way. Right? And just standing up and talking isn't necessarily going to do that. So I have a couple of strategies. I call it my chip points and musical mnemonic devices. Okay? So chip points work this way. You can use these to break up your lecture. Okay? And you're standing there talking head for an hour and a half or whatever. It can be a little bit troublesome for the students to maintain <coughs> consciousness, let alone their attention to you. So you can actually ask questions of them as you're lecturing along and give them points for answering them correctly. 
Uh, you can review previous topics or foreshadow topics that are coming up, hopefully that they've read about, especially if you have a flipped classroom, right? Hopefully they've read about these things in advance. You can ask them off the cuff. You just think of something as you're lecturing along, just toss it out there. Or if you're you know, more measured in your approach to lecturing, you can also simply embed it into your PowerPoint presentation so it pops up at the appropriate time, and you'll see that the students will respond. Uh, chip points are earned when the students raise their hands, you call on them, they provide a correct, a correct answer, and then you know, throw them a plastic token uh, that's worth a point in the class. And it's always a little bit of a problem to figure out you know, how am I going to record this in addition to everything else. My method is pretty simple. I use uh, note cards, colored note cards like this with the students' names on them, and then I actually am going to uh, record their number of chip points at the end of each class that way. They can actually place them right on the cards if you lay them out for them. It makes it very easy to keep track of how many of these points they've actually earned. Uh, they can be integrated pretty easily with your current peer meeting system. Someone who might be using participation or attendance points right now, uh, you can just substitute the chip points for that. You can also use it as extra credit. We all know students love extra credit, right? I always tell them I'm the king of extra credit, right? Well, uh, chip points, what I do is I actually combine my chip points with my pop quiz points. I don't call them that because it freaks students out. I call them mini quizzes, but uh, with the pop quiz points, and therefore the chip points kind of help to fill in the hole they might have uh, made, I guess you could say, on the pop quizzes. They, the students really feel a sense of gratification as they watch their stack of chip points grow. And your better students, your stronger students, are going to compete with one another in order to try to be the one with the most chips in that week. And weaker students can actually be coaxed and coached to get to a correct answer. So it gives you a little bit of interaction, and it doesn't take too long to do so. Why? I'm looking here. Here is the same question right now. What is the name of the world's best community college? Lewis! It is Ivy Tech uh, Community College, of course. Very good, sir. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And how about this one? In what year was this fabulous institution established? 1963, 51 years ago. Excellent, Matthew. Well done. And then they would come up after class and place those on their cards and earn some points for the class, right? All right, here's the other one I'd like to share with you. These are musical mnemonic devices, all right? They, uh, have you ever had a song that's stuck in your head and you just can't get rid of it? Well, you can actually use that quirk of the human brain to reinforce course content in a fun manner, okay? Borrow the tune from a well-known song, or one that the students are probably going to be familiar with. These can be children's songs, top 40 hits, Disney classics, whatever. And then write your own subject-appropriate lyrics to it, okay? Probably some pieces of advice I'd give you is maintain the original meter and rhyme scheme of that song so it fits to the music. Uh, use some keywords in there and explain their significance so that the students will have a little uh, hook to help trigger their memory when they're singing the song in their head taking your exam. And certainly use humor. It really works well, particularly in this particular aspect of uh, mnemonics here. Uh, so you can surprise your students just by suddenly breaking into song in the middle of your lectures and you would be response, response to crisis that you get from those students, okay? Now you might be thinking to yourself, I am not a lyricist. Well, that's okay, you don't have to be. You can look on the internet and YouTube to find mnemonic devices that are out there. There are posted videos and various other things so that you could use if you wanted to. What if you think you're not a vocalist? Not how many of you are thinking that way? And some of you are saying, I can't sing. Don't be shy. Bad singing makes this, makes this even funnier and more memorable, okay? So it's okay, put yourself out on the limb. So, Anyway, I've done some actual research on this in my own classrooms, gathered data over several semesters, and I have uh, crunched the numbers and seen it. It's a phenomenal response or a phenomenal effect uh, helping them to hold on to that information. And students will also tell you that they will continue to use these mnemonics in future courses. And uh, they come back and thank me about, for that all the time. I got that one right on that exam because you gave me that mnemonic to help you remember it. They're very enthusiastic about these things, especially if you are as well. And you, you, know, you might want to get them a songbook after you've developed a few of these. Uh, you might want to let them audio record you, which is you know, something they'll be singing with you all the way down the, uh, the road from uh, class to home or something like that. They'll even teach these to their children for show and tell. I've actually had them do that. So you're reaching two generations of Ivy Techers at the same time. Now that's a real deal, isn't it? Okay. Okay, oh, and now a medley. Uh, musical mnemonics. Remember, I'm an anatomy and physiology teacher. This could be done for any subject, right? Okay, here we go. 
high. The thalamus surrounds most of ventricle three. It's the center of the secretion of hormones for the pituitary high. The thalamus in charge of regulating temperature and sleep and the messages that keep your ANS a functioning. Region. So Gary, Indiana is our seat, right? So this is to Gary, Indiana from Houston. Hairy teratoma, hairy teratoma, hairy teratoma. A mass of hair, teeth, nails, and skin. Hairy teratoma, hairy teratoma, ovaries, the homa, your undeveloped twin. Medulla oblongata, pyramids are its thing. Medulla oblongata, it controls vomiting. It regulates your heartbeat, blood pressure, and breathing. It's your olive neurology. Medulla oblongata. Two rows of epithelium, columnar epithelium. Looks like it has many layers, even though it just has one. If this hairs be hard enough, they'll push not up your lung. Ew, that's why pseudostratifies the coolest epithelium. <laughs> I'll take the day I studied, my professor said to me. Twelve tongue protruding, eleven neck muscles moving, ten gaps of flowing, nine throats following, eight ears and hearing, seven faces steering, six eyesight hearing. Five feels and stings, takes all the room. Four down and out, three loose eyes, about two, let you see. And smell with nerve number one, it's olfactory. Mr. <laughs> Morgan, you know, remember, teaching is supposed to be fun, and it can be. Find something that you're enthusiastic about and go for it. Thank you. Really. <laughs> um, okay, next I'd like to introduce Melinda Mansfield. She's Assistant Professor of Student Success in the North Central Region. Hello. I'm not going to think. <laughs> I've got my cheat sheet here. Um, Have you learned nothing? <laughs> um, okay. So uh, today we talked a lot about engaging students and what we're really talking about is getting the students to retain information in fun and unique ways. And um, so I like that little video clip that we saw in the first uh, part of the day today where the female student said, stuff gets into our head better. And that's kind of what we need to do as teachers is con constantly uh, reevaluate our teaching system. So I want to put some questions out here for you because I've done a lot of research with retention and. Um, I uh, published, um, published. I uh, published two articles on retention and uh, persistence rates and collaborative learning. And North Central Region is probably so sick of me talking about collaborative learning, but you're going to hear some more today. Uh, so I want to ask all of you for retention for our students. What percentage do you think students um, retain when they just simply read the text? Just shout it out. Ten. Ten percent. Ten. Ten percent is the correct answer. Um, and what percentage of what we hear do we retain? What? Twenty. Okay. And then what we see and hear? Fifty. And then what we discuss with others? Six. 70, we see a trend here, right? And then uh, what we experience is 80%, and what we can teach others is 95%. Um, so here's something that we do in my class, we kind of do a flipped classroom, because I do believe that um, the learning portion, the knowledge part needs to take place outside the class, and when they come in the class, that's when they apply what they have learned. So the first or second day of class, I teach four different types of note-taking skills. Um, I teach all of um, the uh, student, new student seminar and first year experience, and I teach them online as well. So the first or second class, I teach four different notes. I teach concept lists, concept maps. I teach how to outline, and I teach how to do reflective writing. 
Um, so every time I assign a chapter, we start with chapter three in our class. They are assigned a, di a different type of note-taking style so they can practice that. So they go home and they practice those note-taking skills, and I said, it doesn't even have to be good. Just try it. Just read through the material, take the notes, bring it to class, because then we'll have group work. So the first uh, 15, 20 minutes of every one of my classes, students get into their groups, they discuss what they thought was most important in the chapter, and then they go up to the board and they write their topic that they thought was most important on the board. So the key here, though, is that if somebody in group one goes and writes up on the board um, lifelong learning skills or something like that, the other groups cannot touch that topic, so they have to have a backup topic. And then we have a long discussion as a whole group at the end. So by that time, we're looking at the read material, which is the 10%. They um, heard the material, saw, hear, discussed with others. Their experiences when we do the application process is like um, when we do um, active listening uh, projects in the classroom and stuff like that. So they're retaining that information naturally so that when we do go to the PowerPoint, I'm skipping through the PowerPoints, which are up on Blackboard, by the way. Um, there, I'm skipping through them pretty quickly because they covered it on their own naturally. Um, so that's one of the ways that I use engaging in the classroom to have students collaborate and kind of learn by natural experiences and um, learn from different perspectives of others and their test scores seem to go up a little higher in our courses. So that's what I do.